Good morning. Open us, open us, open with us in your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I appreciate, uh, Chelsea, that prayer you opened with. That helped get me going, and thank you, Tim, for that prayer. Pretty much says, I've worshipped now. I could go home. <laughs> Thank for not leaving yet, though. But a good, good uh, 30 minutes or so of, of worshipping together. Let's look and, and read in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth, just, of, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Father, as we do seek and continue to worship you this morning, we pray as we do weekly, that you might enable and empower and help us to worship over your word. We have a text which is uh, challenging to us. So we pray that you might open our mind, open our hearts, help us to think of this from the inside out, that you've come to us, you're in us, and you want to help us and show us the way, the way to go. And we trust you for that in Christ's name. Amen. The difference between Jesus' ethic and that of the Pharisees is this. The Pharisees and scribes would not touch what was unclean because it wasn't holy. Jesus would go to the unholy and make it clean. That's essentially the difference. They would not touch the unclean. Jesus changes the unclean and makes it holy. This morning we look at a text, pretty challenging text, a lot of hard stuff in there, <laughs> a lot of descriptions that, are, that uh, we say, okay, I've read that, I don't know that I want to spend much time there. But it's there for a purpose. The church has been growing. Uh, we know that uh, Timothy's there at Ephesus. He's the young pastor, and uh, that church has been there for some time. The gospel's gone out from Ephesus to the surrounding area. Churches are being planted. They become seedling churches, and they continue to, to multiply and grow outward. They're just a microscopic part of this mighty empire, but nonetheless, they're there, and they're growing. Good things are happening. At the same time, all this growth is taking place, people being gathered in, there's trouble. And the apostle says, he calls it difficult. And you read that and you go, that looks difficult. <laughs> that looks pretty hard. Well, we want to think this morning about holiness, what it is, what it isn't. We want to think about how the gospel how the good news of Christ, which we've heard so much about in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, that gospel that we're to guard, not by hiding it, but by displaying it, by proclaiming it, that gospel that we're to suffer for because it's worthy of suffering, that gospel that brings the light of the glory of God to life is occurring, it's taking place, and it changes people. At the same time, there's a resistance to that gospel. There's resistance to Christ. There's resistance to a holy life. And we want to look at these things and deal with them, hopefully and honestly, this morning. 
And I want to start with our gospel communities holy. Our gospel communities holy, and there's a possessive there because the sentence isn't complete. And we're going to go on. But I want to think about the gospel and holiness for a minute. First of all, the gospel of holiness. It's, it's the truth that speaks that there's a holy God and his means for an unholy people to become holy is the gospel. He uses the gospel to take that which is unholy and make it holy. The Pharisees might refuse to touch it. Jesus is comfortable going into the street, going into the marketplace, wherever he would be, and helping people come to God and find a way to live. You know, it, the book, uh, Second Timothy, begins with, by the will of God, according to his promise of the life that's in Christ Jesus. This is part of the life that is in Christ Jesus, that he would take the unholy and make it holy. In chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of our works or anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and his own grace. That's part of what God is doing in this gospel of holiness. And then next, the holiness of the gospel. The gospel is God's gospel. That makes it holy. It's God's truth. That makes it holy. It is the news which is uniquely set apart as God's message. It's holy, absolute, and unique. So we're not ashamed of it. The gospel's pleasing to God. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. I love this thought. The gospel of the glory of the blessed God. I think that's the third time I've referred to it now. The gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which I think means essentially God likes the gospel. <laughs> He's pleased with this. It's the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. And that's part of the holiness of the gospel. Isaiah 46 says, I am God, there's no other. I am God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my pleasure. And the gospel is... God's pleasure. <laughs> he's accomplishing the gospel and he's accomplishing it in you and me as we come to terms with Christ and his message. Third, the gospel in holiness. Live the gospel. You live the gospel in holiness. And that's where we are today in chapter three. This is going to take the power out of empty religion. And it gives us another reason why we need chapter three or uh, chapter two, verse one. Be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. The only way I'm going to live the gospel in holiness is through Christ. Strengthening, strengthening me with his grace. You live the gospel and you live the gospel in holiness. It said in chapter two, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, Christians enjoy the God-pleasing grace of sins forgiven, of him moving within us, and we make choices for holiness. We cleanse ourselves as we can as he's enabling us, and we're authentic with him. I love how it says this in chapter 2, verse 10 of Titus so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Savior, let me say it again. So that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Type Titus 2, 10. I adorn, I adorn the doctrine of God my Savior by how I live. <laughs> That's just an amazing thought. I adorn the doctrine of God, my Savior, by the gospel coming into life 
in me and moving me and changing that which is unholy to something that's holy. It's a beautiful thought. Well, our gospel community's holy love. If we look closely at our text, we find love mentioned, I think it's four times. In verse 2, the love of money. Uh, we go on, uh, not loving good, uh, lovers of pleasure. Oh, and I missed the first one, uh, lovers of self. Uh, four times he talks about uh, love. Now, he, he begins there in verse 1, but understand this, that in the last days, and so they're in the last days, and Jesus said, Matthew 24, all these things are the beginnings of birth pangs. Uh, some of you know a lot about birth pangs, but it's difficult. It's hard. The last days are difficult. And Jesus said, I'm here. It started. And it's still happening. And they're in the midst of these difficult last days. And then as he goes into this paragraph, we find there's all this uh, misplaced love or love going to the wrong, the wrong direction. We want to think about this for some minutes, I think, as we think about our gospel community's holy, holy love. Augustine had a concept of supreme love. He said, supreme love reorders all your loves. Supreme love reorders all your loves. Now, I think what he meant is that if you get connected with God's love, the love of God in Jesus Christ, that's the supreme love. And if that supreme comes into your life and you know that love, you taste drink on that fountain of the love of God, it changes and reorders all your other loves. It doesn't deface your loves. It's not like your loves are bad things, even they could be very good things. Uh, maybe, maybe you love farming. Well, good. But if you have the love of God in your life, it will reorder your love for farming. doesn't mean you're not going to love farming, but it will change it somehow. Or maybe you love bowling. Maybe it will. I don't know. I don't know about bowling. <laughs> but it reorders our lives and, and, and reorders things that aren't necessarily bad things. Does that make sense? I think it does. The su supreme love reorders all of our loves. I like that thought. There's a reason why we're still reading Augustine's stuff. But let me enumerate some things quickly. He speaks here about self-love. You know, one of the kind of the reigning cliches of, of our day is that you have to learn to love yourself. And then you can love others. And, you know, there's some element, okay. But it also, the way it's used here, is a self-indulgent love. And there's, even with the cliches today, we can make a mistake about self-love. I think it might take a different, little bit different form uh, over the last few years. I hear a lot now about identity. Everything I read, everybody's talking about identity. And it sounds like you, you find your own identity and you learn to like your identity and then it's everybody else's job to affirm your identity. So you go, I'm going to find my identity, I'm going to learn to like my identity, and now you need to affirm my identity. And... That's got the makings of a problem. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the amazing things about the gospel is that I receive an identity. It's by the grace of God. I have a new idea of myself. He gives me, by his grace, a new identity. And the unique thing about the gospel is 
I don't earn it and I don't, well, I learn about it, but it's received. That doesn't make any sense <laughs> unless you come to grips with Christ and you realize he wants to give to me. He wants to give good to me. And one of the things he wants to give to me is a new identity, a new sense of self and how I can live. And, and be with him. Well, let's move on. He talks about lovers of money. And, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of time here. We all know the power of money because we've felt it and we fight it, hopefully. Uh, it's the money dragon. The money dragon always says, always whispers what? How'd you know that? <laughs> he took my thunder away. Yeah, he's always whispering more, isn't he? Yeah, we do know about this. It just never ends. More, more. And there's this love of money that we have to, we have to run away from it. Lovers of pleasure, he mentions in verse 4. In John Piper's excellent book, Desiring God, I read some years ago, he, he points out that we're built for desire, and he, he quotes the, the reformers in this, the Reformation, that our hearts are a desire factory. We are always desiring things. And we really are looking for ways to fulfill our, our deep desires. And God tells us for our own good, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And drink from that fountain. And there, there you will find the greatest of pleasures, period, bar none. You drink from the fountain of the glory of God, and you'll know pleasure. But lo lovers of pleasure tend to drink from the wrong fountain, and it leads in the wrong direction and the wrong order of life. He says in verse 3, uh, not loving good, uh, to love good, you know, we respond, I think, like Isaiah. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. To love good, I have to realize I'm not good. I got a problem. <laughs> and I need the coal on my lips, and I need to repent. I was reading a book by J.I. Packer years ago, and he started a section on five different facets of repentance. And I remember as I was reading this, thinking, who comes up with five different facets of repentance? They were all biblical ideas. And I thought, it's somebody who reads the Bible carefully and takes this seriously, that I need to repent of my not loving what is good and loving other things and turn from that sin and pray that God restores me like he does Isaiah, press the coal to my lips so I can cry out, woe is me. I'm undone without the grace of God. You know, really, uh, not loving good changes if you simply look at Christ. You'll learn to love good if you look right at him. You read about him, you read about him in something like the Gospel of John. It changes how you think about good as you, looked, as you look at him. And then you say, yes, Jesus, I understand and believe that you want to give me more good. And I want all the good you have for me. Okay, lovers of God is my fifth idea here. Uh, the psalmist cried out, whom I have, whom I, whom I have, hmm, I wrote that down wrong. <laughs> whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. forever. There's lots of psalms like this. Psalm 16, David said, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. And, you know, it's in relation to everything else he sees. Here is good. Psalm 63, O oh God, you're my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary 
beholding your power and your glory. And there's David, and like all of the psalmists would say, I'm only going to find this good if I drink from the right fountain in the glory of God. One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the, of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That, that whole spirit is the, is the God lover. It's the lover of God. And I think it's learned. Well, let me summarize this idea here with a few other texts about love. Uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit. What's the first one? I knew you'd get that one. Not many of you, but I knew you'd get it. <laughs> it's the first fruit, isn't it? Love. And it, it generally is front and center all the time in the New Testament. In John 13, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. There's a high goal, high standard for love. But the message is, is love. And as Augustine said, if you have the supreme love, it reorders all your loves. Instead of perhaps accepting God's love, many of us might try just to love better. It always begins. Get in touch with the supreme love and let him change you. He will. He will. You can't have the love of God in your life and not be changed and transformed by it. Our gospel's community's holy love counters empty religion. Our gospel community's holy love counters empty religion. Look what he says there in verse 5 of chapter 3. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And I know I'm skipping a lot of these words, but I don't know what else to do, but just to try to summarize these things. But, and it kind of surprises me that it's even there. Having the appearance of godliness, because none of it looks like it has an appearance of godliness to me. But I suppose he's, He's, he's brushing with wide strokes, and there's a lot of things out there, a, a lot of evil, a lot of difficulty, a lot of things that are going against Christ and the gospel and the church. And one of these is things that appear like they're moving forward in godliness, but they're empty. And it's all man-made kapui. And it doesn't work. Kapui is a very technological term for it doesn't work. It just does not work. You can write it down if you want. <laughs> well, Jesus condemns all this. Matthew 23, 25. You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. I want to agree with him in that until I remember that all that stuff's inside of me too. And I need that reforming, cleaning work that he would do within me too. It's part of uh, being human. And I just want to start on the outside instead of the inside. But he starts on the inside, so that he cleans up the outside. Luke 18, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Pharisee, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I get. Tax collector, standing far off, would not lift up his eyes to heaven, beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be, exhaust, be exalted. You know, Jesus was real big on humility. And that we would not have empty religion, but that our hearts were, would be filled with him. If he fills us up, if he fills the heart, he changes the heart, and that changes what I do in the street. 
So he has some other words here that are helpful to us. Let's look at verses 6 through 8. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. And he tells us to be on guard here. There are those who come. And what do you do with these people? Verse 5, you avoid them. You avoid such people. Well, we think, you know, we're not supposed to avoid people. Aren't we supposed to help people? (laughs) But the apostle said, look, you avoid this. If they're coming at you and they're coming into your church, you know, call a spade a spade. You turn on the TV on any Christian station, about nine-tenths of it you need to avoid. I mean it literally. (laughs) There is so much that goes on in the name of Christ that isn't Christ. if, If you're watching something and it lacks humility, pretty good sign something's wrong. Or if they want you to send a donation so you can get some holy water. That's another one. I, I, I mention that because I think the first year I became a pastor, a lady in my church came up and showed me her vial of holy water. I knew exactly what had happened. <laughs> you know, well, there's also a side of this too. And we need to remember that these things can come into this room via me, via you and me. And if we lack humility, we're going to make more mistakes. But if we walk with Christ, he can help us in the way we should go. You know, it, it's, it's stated so strongly here. Look, you be aware of error. Not in your pride, not in this or that, but be careful about the character and why people want what they want. And these guys, in Moses' day, wanted power. And they wanted to be a clo- close to, you know, the, uh, the, who's the head of Egypt? Pharaoh. The Pharaoh, thank you. Yeah. You know, they wanted to be close to Pharaoh. And all that power. <clears throat> and uh, so they could do some miracles. They could do some pretty cool things. And in the end, they are found out. And that's where he does uh, go with this. But first, look what he does with felt needs here. For among them are those who creep into household, households, captured weak women, burdened with sins, let astray with various passions, always learning, never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. You know, there's a lot that goes on in, in, in just a few verses here. But there's weakness trying to capitalize on it. Let's capitalize on weakness and take advantage of it. And that's a sure sign. Something's wrong. Uh, find a weakness. And the door's open to start drinking from the wrong fountain and going the wrong way. Also, this whole thing about learning. Always, seven, always learning, never able to arrive in a knowledge of the truth. For many, uh, knowledge means power. Uh, I think it was true then. If you have knowledge that someone else doesn't have, it means you have spiritual authority. Uh, I was teaching one of the first times ever in Africa. I had a guy sitting right there. I'd ask a question. We were talking about something in the Gospel of Mark. He started saying, it's a secret. It's a secret. It was a simple question. No, it's a secret. And then he said, you know. This guy taught in a Bible college, which was scary. But it was all about, if I have knowledge, he doesn't have. I'm closer to the one who gives the knowledge, 
so I have more authority. And that's how he operated, which is a superstition, which comes into a lot. Of, it, it comes out in different ways. But, you know, that happens in America. I got knowledge you don't have. Therefore, I have more authority. I have something, more power. And he's saying, look out for this stuff. Watch out. And if there's not love and humility there apparent, it might be a good thing to run, or run the opposite direction. Opposing the truth and the counterfeit fruit. He talks about oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind, disqualified regarding the faith. And, I mean, those aren't empty words. People will oppose the truth and they're disqualified. What do you do? You avoid them. You be careful of them. And then there's a, a, some short practical ideas for, that we would take note of here. First, this begins with a command, understand. What does he say? Second word of my text, chapter, one, chapter 3, verse 1, understand this. We need to apply our minds and our hearts to understanding these things to help us with our relationship with God and as we, as we grow and build the church. We understand this. And then second command is avoid such people. There is a place for saying, okay, you know, we're about the essentials of the gospel. There's freedom in non-essentials. You can cross a line and you're out. If you think, uh, if your essential crosses with ours, this isn't the place for you. But we are about Christ and his gospel and everything he has for us in that. But it, we, a line can be crossed. And then finally there, verse 9. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of these two men. And there's a, a verse of hope. It says, look, in the end they're going to be fined out. So 2,000 years later, we're still here. It's still working. We're still in the last days. We're still from chapter 2. Uh, who's on the throne? Jesus. He's on the, he's on the line of David. He'll sit on the tr throne forever. And he's guaranteed success because he's the only one who can do it. So we know it's him. And we're in a movement that is guaranteed success. No matter what the difficulty of the last days, Jesus wins. And you win because you're with Christ. Amen. You know, we live, in, we live in an extraordinary time. We really do. We have extraordinary opportunity. God is changing you and me. Is that not extraordinary? <laughs> He's changing you and me. He's making us more like the sun. At the same time, we have this extraordinary challenge because we've got counties full of people all around us. There's empty philosophies. People may not even call them religions. You know, uh, I forget the percentages now, but it's like 30 or 40 percent now say, I don't have any religion. Well, they really do. It's just in form of some empty philosophy. And right in this abyss, of empty religion, there's Jesus Christ in all his glory saying, here I am, come to me. And we're here to help others to do that. And we, and we choose to do that. We choose to trust God, trust Christ, give me the grace that I need to step forward and proclaim your goodness. So we're really in a win-win situation. You know, you sense, you sense this with the Apostle Paul. You know, okay, Timothy knows he's in prison and likely to be killed. And then Paul gives him this whole paragraph of warning. We think, well, doesn't he already know about all this? <laughs> but Paul just paints the picture the way it is. Here it is. This is what it looks like. But to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Say what? I'm going to win no matter if I live or if I die. <laughs> it's a win-win. And no matter what the culture tells us or what's going on, we're always in a win-win. We're going to win because Christ wins. 
and we can walk with him. Let's stand together as we close today.